my inventions part six the art of telatomatics by nikola tesla this article was published in electrical experimenter october nineteen nineteen no subject to which i have ever devoted myself has called for such concentration of mind and strained to so dangerous a degree the finest fibres of my brain as the system of which the magnifying transmitter is the foundation i put all the intensity and vigour of youth in the development of the rotating field discoveries but those early labours were of a different character although strenuous in the extreme they did not involve that keen and exhausting discernment which had to be exercised in attacking the many puzzling problems of the wireless despite my rare physical endurance at that period the abused nerves finally rebelled and i suffered a complete collapse just as the consummation of the long and difficult task was almost in sight without doubt i would have paid a greater penalty later and very likely my career would have been prematurely terminated had not providence equipped me with a safety device which has seemed to improve with advancing years and unfailingly comes into play when my forces are at an end so long as it operates i am safe from danger due to overwork which threatens other inventors and incidentally i need no vacations which are indispensable to most people when i am all but used up i simply do as the darkies who naturally fall asleep while white folks worry to venture a theory out of my sphere the body probably accumulates little by little a definite quantity of some toxic agent and i sink into a nearly lethargic state which lasts half an hour to the minute upon awakening i have the sensation as though the events immediately preceding had occurred very long ago and if i attempt to continue the interrupted train of thought i feel a veritable mental nausea involuntarily i then turn to other work and am surprised at the freshness of the mind and ease with which i overcome obstacles that had baffled me before after weeks or months my passion for the temporarily abandoned invention returns and i invariably find answers to all the vexing questions with scarcely any effort in this connection i will tell of an extraordinary experience which may be of interest to students of psychology i had produced a striking phenomenon with my grounded transmitter and was endeavouring to ascertain its true significance in relation to the currents propagated through the earth it seemed a hopeless undertaking and for more than a year i worked unremittingly but in vain this profound study so entirely absorbed me that i became forgetful of everything else even of my undermined health at last as i was at the point of breaking down nature applied the preservative inducing lethal sleep regaining my senses i realized with consternation that i was unable to visualize scenes of my life except those of the infancy the very first ones that had entered my consciousness curiously enough these appeared before my vision with startling distinctness and afforded me welcome relief night after night when retiring i would think of them and more and more of my previous existence was revealed the image of my mother was always the principal figure in the spectacle that slowly unfolded and a consuming desire to see her again gradually took possession of me this feeling grew so strong that i resolved to drop all work and satisfy my longing but i found it too hard to break away from the laboratory and several months elapsed during which i had succeeded in reviving all the impressions of my past life up to the spring of eighteen ninety two in the next picture that came out of the mist of oblivion i saw myself at the hotel de la paix in paris just coming to from one of my peculiar sleeping spells which had been caused by prolonged exertion of the brain imagine the pain and distress i felt when it flashed upon my mind that a dispatch was handed to me at that very moment bearing the sad news that my mother was dying i remembered how i made the long journey home without an hour of rest and how she passed away after weeks of agony it was especially remarkable that during all this period of partially obliterated memory i was fully alive to everything touching on the subject of my research i could recall the smallest details and the least insignificant observations in my experiments and even recite pages of text and complex mathematical formulae 
my belief is firm in a law of compensation the true rewards are ever in proportion to the labor and sacrifices made this is one of the reasons why i feel certain that of all my inventions the magnifying transmitter will prove most important and valuable to future generations i am prompted to this prediction not so much by thoughts of the commercial and industrial revolution which it will surely bring about but of the humanitarian consequences of the many achievements it makes possible considerations of mere utility weigh little in the balance against the higher benefits of civilization we are confronted with portentous problems which cannot be solved just by providing for our material existence however abundantly on the contrary progress in this direction is fraught with hazards and perils not less menacing than those born from want and suffering if we were to release the energy of atoms or discover some other way of developing cheap and unlimited power at any point of the globe this accomplishment instead of being a blessing might bring disaster to mankind in giving rise to dissension and anarchy which would ultimately result in the enthronement of the hated regime of force the greatest good will come from technical improvements tending to unification and harmony and my wireless transmitter is pre-eminently such by its means the human voice and likeness will be reproduced everywhere and factories driven thousands of miles from waterfalls furnishing the power aerial machines will be propelled around the earth without a stop and the sun's energy controlled to create lakes and rivers for motive purposes and transformation of arid deserts into fertile land its introduction for telegraphic telephonic and similar uses will automatically cut out the statics and all other interferences which at present impose narrow limits to the application of the wireless this is a timely topic on which a few words might not be amiss tesla raps static men vigorously during the past decade a number of people have arrogantly claimed that they had succeeded in doing away with this impediment I have carefully examined all of the arrangements described and tested most of them long before they were publicly disclosed but the finding was uniformly negative a recent official statement from the u.s navy may perhaps have taught some beguilable news editors how to appraise these announcements at their real worth as a rule the attempts are based on theories so fallacious that whenever they come to my notice i cannot help thinking in a lighter vein quite recently a new discovery was heralded with a deafening flourish of trumpets but it provided another case of a mountain bringing forth a mouse this reminds me of an exciting incident which took place years ago when i was conducting my experiments with currents of high frequency steve brody had just jumped off the brooklyn bridge the feat has been vulgarized since by imitators but the first report electrified new york I was very impressionable then and frequently spoke of the daring printer on a hot afternoon i felt the necessity of refreshing myself and stepped into one of the popular thirty thousand institutions of this great city where a delicious twelve per cent beverage was served which can now be had only by making a trip to the poor and devastated countries of europe the attendance was large and not over distinguished and a matter was discussed which gave me an admirable opening for the careless remark this is what i said when i jumped off the bridge no sooner had i uttered these words than i felt like the companion of timotheus in the poem of schiller in an instant there was a pandemonium and a dozen voices cried it is brody i threw a quarter on the counter and bolted for the door but the crowd was at my heels with yells stop steve which must have been misunderstood for many persons tried to hold me up as i ran frantically for my haven of refuge by darting around corners i fortunately managed through the medium of a fire escape to reach the laboratory where i threw off my coat camouflaged myself as a hard-working blacksmith and started the forge but these precautions proved unnecessary i had eluded my pursuers for many years afterward at night when imagination turns into spectres the trifling troubles of the day i often thought as i tossed on the bed what my fate would have been had that mob caught me and found out that i was not steve brodie 
now the engineer who lately gave an account before a technical body of a novel remedy against statics based on a heretofore unknown law of nature seems to have been as reckless as myself when he contended that these disturbances propagate up and down while those of a transmitter proceed along the earth it would mean that a condenser as this globe with its gaseous envelope could be charged and discharged in a manner quite contrary to the fundamental teachings propounded in every elementary textbook of physics such a supposition would have been condemned as erroneous even in franklin's time for the facts bearing on this were then well known and the identity between atmospheric electricity and that developed by machines was fully established obviously natural and artificial disturbances propagate through the earth and the air in exactly the same way and both set up electromotive forces in the horizontal as well as vertical sense interference cannot be overcome by any such methods as were proposed the truth is this in the air the potential increases at the rate of about fifty volts per foot of elevation owing to which there may be a difference of pressure amounting to twenty or even forty thousand volts between the upper and lower ends of the antenna the masses of the charged atmosphere are constantly in motion and give up electricity to the conductor not continuously but rather disruptively this producing a grinding noise in a sensitive telephonic receiver the higher the terminal and the greater the spacing compassed by the wires the more pronounced is the effect but it must be understood that it is purely local and has little to do with the real trouble in nineteen hundred while perfecting my wireless system one form of apparatus comprised four antennae these were carefully calibrated to the same frequency and connected in multiple with the object of magnifying the action in receiving from any direction when i desired to ascertain the origin of the transmitted impulses each diagonally situated pair was put in series with a primary coil energizing the detector circuit in the former case the sound was loud in the telephone in the latter it ceased as expected the two antennae neutralizing each other but the true statics manifested themselves in both instances and i had to devise special preventatives embodying different principles the remedy for static by employing receivers connected to two points of the ground as suggested by me long ago this trouble caused by the charged air which is very serious in the structures as now built is nullified and besides the liability of all kinds of interferences is reduced to about one half because of the directional character of the circuit this was perfectly self-evident but came as a revelation to some simple-minded wireless folks whose experience was confined to forms of apparatus that could have been improved with an axe and they have been disposing of the bear's skin before killing him if it were true that strays performed such antics it would be easy to get rid of them by receiving without aerials but as a matter of fact a wire buried in the ground which conforming to this view should be absolutely immune is more susceptible to certain extraneous impulses than one placed vertically in the air to state it fairly a slight progress has been made but not by virtue of any particular method or device it was achieved simply by discarding the enormous structures which are bad enough for transmission but wholly unsuitable for reception and adopting a more appropriate type of receiver as i pointed out in a previous article to dispose of this difficulty for good a radical change must be made in the system and the sooner this is done the better radio government control not wanted it would be calamitous indeed if at this time when the art is in its infancy and the vast majority not excepting even experts have no conception of its ultimate possibilities a measure would be rushed through the legislature making it a government monopoly this was proposed a few weeks ago by secretary daniels and no doubt that distinguished official has made his appeal to the senate and house of representatives with sincere conviction but universal evidence unmistakably shows that the best results are always obtained in healthful commercial competition there are however exceptional reasons why wireless should be given the fullest freedom of development 
in the first place it offers prospects immeasurably greater and more vital to betterment of human life than any other invention or discovery in the history of man then again it must be understood that this wonderful art has been in its entirety evolved here and can be called american with more right and propriety than the telephone the incandescent lamp or the aeroplane enterprising press agents and stock jobbers have been so successful in spreading misinformation that even so excellent a periodical as the scientific american accords the chief credit to a foreign country the germans of course gave us the hertz waves and the russian english french and italian experts were quick in using them for signaling purposes it was an obvious application of the new agent and accomplished with the old classical and unimproved induction coil scarcely anything more than another kind of heliography the radius of transmission was very limited the results attained of little value and the hertz oscillations as a means for conveying intelligence could have been advantageously replaced by sound waves which i advocated in eighteen ninety one moreover all of these attempts were made three years after the basic principles of the wireless system which is universally employed today and its potent instrumentalities had been clearly described and developed in america no trace of those hertzian appliances and methods remains today we have proceeded in the very opposite direction and what has been done is the product of the brains and efforts of citizens of this country the fundamental patents have expired and the opportunities are open to all the chief argument of the secretary is based on interference according to his statement reported in the new york herald of july twenty ninth signals from a powerful station can be intercepted in every village of the world in view of this fact which was demonstrated in my experiments of nineteen hundred it would be of little use to impose restrictions in the united states america first as throwing light on this point i may mention that only recently an odd-looking gentleman called on me with the object of enlisting my services in the construction of world transmitters in some distant land we have no money he said but carloads of solid gold and we will give you a liberal amount i told him that i wanted to see first what will be done with my inventions in america and this ended the interview but i am satisfied that some dark forces are at work and as time goes on the maintenance of continuous communication will be rendered more difficult the only remedy is a system immune against interruption it has been perfected it exists and all that is necessary is to put it in operation the terrible conflict is still uppermost in the minds and perhaps the greatest importance will be attached to the magnifying transmitter as a machine for attack and defense more particularly in connection with telautomatics this invention is a logical outcome of observations begun in my boyhood and continued throughout my life when the first results were published the electrical review started editorially that it would become one of the most potent factors in the advance and civilization of mankind the time is not distant when this prediction will be fulfilled in eighteen ninety eight and nineteen hundred it was offered to the government and might have been adopted were i one of those who would go to alexander's shepherd when they want a favor from alexander at that time i really thought that it would abolish war because of its unlimited destructiveness and exclusion of the personal element of combat but while i have not lost faith in its potentialities my views have changed since the road to permanent peace war cannot be avoided until the physical cause for its recurrence is removed and this in the last analysis is the vast extent of the planet on which we live only through annihilation of distance in every respect as the conveyance of intelligence transport of passengers and supplies and transmission of energy will conditions be brought about some day ensuring permanency of friendly relations what we now want most is closer contact and better understanding between individuals and communities all over the earth and the elimination of that fanatic devotion to exalted ideals of national egoism and pride which is always prone to plunge the world into primeval barbarism and strife 
no league or parliamentary act of any kind will ever prevent such a calamity these are only new devices for putting the weak at the mercy of the strong i have expressed myself in this regard fourteen years ago when a combination of a few leading governments a sort of holy alliance was advocated by the late andrew carnegie who may be fairly considered as the father of this idea having given to it more publicity and impetus than anybody else prior to the efforts of the president while it cannot be denied that such a pact might be of material advantage to some less fortunate peoples it cannot attain the chief object sought peace can only come as a natural consequence of universal enlightenment and merging of races and we are still far from this blissful realization as i view the world of to-day in the light of the gigantic struggle we have witnessed i am filled with conviction that the interests of humanity would be best served if the united states remained true to its traditions and kept out of entangling alliances situated as it is geographically remote from the theatres of impending conflicts without incentive to territorial aggrandizement with inexhaustible resources and immense population thoroughly imbued with the spirit of liberty and right this country is placed in a unique and privileged position it is thus able to exert independently its colossal strength and moral force to the benefit of all more judiciously and effectively than as a member of a league the mechanistic theory of life in one of these biographical sketches published in the electrical experimenter i have dwelt on the circumstances of my early life and told of an affliction which compelled me to unremitting exercise of imagination and self-observation this mental activity at first involuntary under the pressure of illness and suffering gradually became second nature and led me finally to recognize that i was but an automaton devoid of free will in thought and action and merely responsive to the forces of the environment our bodies are of such complexity of structure the motions we perform are so numerous and involved and the external impressions on our sense organs to such a degree delicate and elusive that it is hard for the average person to grasp this fact and yet nothing is more convincing to the trained investigator than the mechanistic theory of life which had been in a measure understood and propounded by descartes three hundred years ago but in this time many important functions of our organism were unknown and especially with respect to the nature of light and the construction and operation of the eye philosophers were in the dark in recent years the progress of scientific research in these fields has been such as to leave no room for a doubt in regard to this view on which many works have been published one of its ablest and most eloquent exponents is perhaps felix le dantec formerly assistant of pasteur professor jacques loeb has performed remarkable experiments in heliotropism clearly establishing the controlling power of light in lower forms of organisms and his latest book forced movements is revelatory but while men of science accept this theory simply as any other that is recognized to me it is a truth which i hourly demonstrate by every act and thought of mine the consciousness of the external impression prompting me to any kind of exertion physical or mental is ever present in my mind only on very rare occasions when i was in a state of exceptional concentration have i found difficulty in locating the original impulses lack of observation a form of ignorance the by far greater number of human beings are never aware of what is passing around and within them and millions fall victims of disease and die prematurely just on this account the commonest everyday occurrences appear to them mysterious and inexplicable one may feel a sudden wave of sadness and rake his brain for an explanation when he might have noticed that it was caused by a cloud cutting off the rays of the sun he may see the image of a friend dear to him under conditions which he construed as very peculiar when only shortly before he has passed him in the street or seen his photograph somewhere when he loses a collar button he fusses and swears for an hour being unable to visualize his previous actions and locate the object directly 
deficient observation is merely a form of ignorance and responsible for the many morbid notions and foolish ideas prevailing there is not more than one out of every ten persons who does not believe in telepathy and other psychic manifestations spiritualism and communion with the dead and who would refuse to listen to willing or unwilling deceivers just to illustrate how deeply rooted this tendency has become even among the clear-headed american population i may mention a comical incident psychic phenomena in the manufacture of flivvers shortly before the war when the exhibition of my turbines in this city elicited widespread comment in the technical papers i anticipated that there would be a scramble among manufacturers to get hold of the invention and i had particular designs on that man from detroit who has an uncanny faculty for accumulating millions so confident was i that he would turn up some day that i declared this as certain to my secretary and assistants sure enough one fine morning a body of engineers from the ford motor company presented themselves with the request of discussing with me an important project didn't i tell you i remarked triumphantly to my employees and one of them said you are amazing mr tesla everything comes out exactly as you predict as soon as these hard-headed men were seated i of course immediately began to extol the wonderful features of my turbine when the spokesman interrupted me and said we know all about this but we are on a special errand we have formed a psychological society for the investigation of psychic phenomena and we want you to join us in this undertaking i suppose those engineers never knew how near they came to being fired out of my office confuting spiritism ever since i was told by some of the greatest men of the time leaders in science whose names are immortal that i am possessed of an unusual mind i bent all my thinking faculties on the solution of great problems regardless of sacrifice for many years i endeavored to solve the enigma of death and watched eagerly for every kind of spiritual indication but only once in the course of my existence have i had an experience which momentarily impressed me as supernatural it was at the time of my mother's death i had become completely exhausted by pain and long vigilance and one night was carried to a building about two blocks from our home as i lay helpless there i thought that if my mother died while i was away from her bedside she would surely give me a sign two or three months before i was in london in company with my late friend sir william crookes when spiritualism was discussed and i was under the full sway of these thoughts i might not have paid attention to other men but was susceptible to his arguments as it was his epochal work on radiant matter which i had read as a student that made me embrace the electrical career i reflected that the conditions for a look into the beyond were most favorable for my mother was a woman of genius and particularly excelling in the powers of intuition during the whole night every fiber in my brain was strained in expectancy but nothing happened until early in the morning when i fell in a sleep or perhaps a swoon and saw a cloud carrying angelic figures of marvelous beauty one of whom gazed upon me lovingly and gradually assumed the features of my mother the appearance slowly floated across the room and vanished and i was awakened by an indescribably sweet song of many voices in that instant a certitude which no words can impress came upon me that my mother had just died and that was true i was unable to understand the tremendous weight of the painful knowledge i received in advance and wrote a letter to sir william crookes while still under the domination of these impressions and in poor bodily health when i recovered i sought for a long time the external cause of this strange manifestation and to my great relief i succeeded after many months of fruitless effort i had seen the painting of a celebrated artist representing allegorically one of the seasons in the form of a cloud with a group of angels which seemed to actually float in the air and this had struck me forcefully it was exactly the same that appeared in my dream with the exception of my mother's likeness the music came from the choir in the church nearby at the early mass of easter morning 
explaining everything satisfactorily in conformity with scientific facts. This occurred long ago, and I have never had the faintest reason since to change my views on psychical and spiritual phenomena, for which there is absolutely no foundation. The belief in these is the natural outgrowth of intellectual development. Religious dogmas are no longer accepted in their orthodox meaning, but every individual clings to faith in a supreme power of some kind. We all must have an ideal to govern our conduct and ensure contentment, but it is immaterial whether it be one of creed, art, science, or anything else, so long as it fulfills the function of a dematerializing force. It is essential to the peaceful existence of humanity as a whole that one common conception should prevail. Tesla's Astounding Discovery While I have failed to obtain any evidence in support of the contentions of psychologists and spiritualists, I have proved to my complete satisfaction the automatism of life, not only through continuous observations of individual actions, but even more conclusively through certain generalizations. These amount to a discovery which I consider of the greatest moment to human society, and on which I shall briefly dwell. I got the first inkling of this astounding truth when I was still a very young man, but for many years I interpreted what I noted simply as coincidences. Namely, whenever either myself, or a person to whom I was attached, or a cause to which I was devoted, was hurt by others in a particular way, which might be best properly characterized as the most unfair imaginable, I experienced a singular and undefinable pain, which, for want of a better term, I have qualified as cosmic, and shortly thereafter, and invariably, those who had inflicted it came to grief. After many such cases I confided this to a number of friends, who had the opportunity to convince themselves of the truth of the theory which I have gradually formulated, and which may be stated in the following few words. Our bodies are of similar construction, and exposed to the same external influences. This results in likeness of response and concordance of the general activities on which all our social and other rules and laws are based. We are automata entirely controlled by the forces of the medium, being tossed about like corks on the surface of the water, but mistaking the resultant of the impulses from the outside for free will. The movements and other actions we perform are always life-preservative, and though seemingly quite independent from one another, we are connected by invisible links. So long as the organism is in perfect order, it responds accurately to the agents that prompt it, but the moment that there is some derangement in any individual, his self-preservative power is impaired. Everybody understands, of course, that if one becomes death, has his eyesight weakened or his limbs injured, the chances for his continued existence are lessened. But this is also true, and perhaps more so, of certain defects in the brain, which deprive the automaton, more or less, of that vital quality and cause it to rush into destruction. A very sensitive and observant being, with his highly developed mechanism all intact, and acting with precision in obedience to the changing conditions of the environment, is endowed with a transcending mechanical sense, enabling him to evade perils too subtle to be directly perceived. When he comes in contact with others whose controlling organs are radically faulty, that sense asserts itself, and he feels the cosmic pain. The truth of this has been borne out in hundreds of instances, and I am inviting other students of nature to devote attention to this subject, believing that through combined and systematic effort, results of incalculable value to the world will be obtained. Dr. Tesla's First Automaton The idea of constructing an automaton to bear out my theory presented itself to me early, but I did not begin active work until 1893, when I started my wireless investigations. During the succeeding two or three years, a number of automatic mechanisms, to be actuated from a distance, were constructed by me and exhibited to visitors in my laboratory. In 1896, however, 
I designed a complete machine capable of a multitude of operations, but the consummation of my labors was delayed until late 1897. This machine was illustrated and described in my article in the Century Magazine of June 1900 and other periodicals of that time, and, when first shown in the beginnings of 1898, it created a sensation such as no other invention of mine has ever produced. In November 1898, a basic patent on the novel art was granted to me, but only after the examiner-in-chief had come to New York and witnessed the performance, for what I claimed seemed unbelievable. I remember that when later I called on an official in Washington, with a view of offering the invention to the government, he burst out in laughter upon my telling him what I had accomplished. Nobody thought, then, that there was the faintest prospect of perfecting such a device. It is unfortunate that in this patent, following the advice of my attorneys, I indicated the control as being effected through the medium of a single circuit and a well-known form of detector, for the reason that I had not yet secured protection on my methods and apparatus for individualization. As a matter of fact, my boats were controlled through the joint action of several circuits and interference of every kind was excluded. Most generally, I employed receiving circuits in the form of loops, including condensers, because the discharges of my high-tension transmitter ionizing the air in the hull so that even a very small aerial would draw electricity from the surrounding atmosphere for hours. Just to give an idea, I found, for instance, that a bulb twelve inches in diameter, highly exhausted, and with one single terminal to which a short wire was attached, would deliver well onto one thousand successive flashes before all charge of the air in the laboratory was neutralized. The loop form of receiver was not sensitive to such a disturbance, and it is curious to note that it is becoming popular at this late date. In reality, it collects much less energy than the aerials or a long grounded wire, but it so happens that it does away with a number of defects inherent to the present wireless devices. In demonstrating my invention before audiences, the visitors were requested to ask any questions, however involved, and the automaton would answer them by signs. This was considered magic at that time, but was extremely simple for it was myself who gave the replics by means of the device. At the same period, another larger tetautomatic boat was constructed, a photograph of which is shown in this number of the electrical experimenter. It was controlled by loops, having several turns placed in the hull, which was made entirely watertight and capable of submergence. The apparatus was similar to that used in the first, with the exception of certain special features I introduced, as, for example, incandescent lamps which afforded a visible evidence of the proper functioning of the machine. Telautomatics of the Future These automata, controlled within the range of vision of the operator, were, however, the first and rather crude steps in the evolution of the art of telautomatics as I had conceived it. The next logical improvement was its application to automatic mechanisms beyond the limits of vision and at a great distance from the center of control, and I have ever since advocated their employment as instruments of warfare in preference to guns. The importance of this now seems to be recognized, if I am to judge from casual announcements through the press of achievements which are said to be extraordinary but contain no merit of novelty whatever. In an imperfect manner it is practicable, with the existing wireless plants, to launch an aeroplane, have it follow a certain approximate course, and perform some operation at a distance of many hundreds of miles. A machine of this kind can also be mechanically controlled in several ways, and I have no doubt that it may prove of some usefulness in war. But there are, to my best knowledge, no instrumentalities in existence today with which such an object could be accomplished in a precise manner. I have devoted years of study to this matter, and have evolved means, making such and greater wonders easily realizable. As stated on a previous occasion, when I was a student at college, I conceived a flying machine quite unlike the present ones. 
the underlying principle was sound but could not be carried into practice for want of a prime mover of sufficiently great activity in recent years i have successfully solved this problem and i am now planning aerial machines devoid of sustaining planes ailerons propellers and other external attachments which will be capable of immense speeds and are very likely to furnish powerful arguments for peace in the near future such a machine sustained and propelled entirely by reaction is shown on one of the pages and is supposed to be controlled either mechanically or by wireless energy by installing proper plants it will be practicable to project a missile of this kind into the air and drop it almost on the very spot designated which may be thousands of miles away but we are not going to stop at this telautomata will be ultimately produced capable of acting as if possessed of their own intelligence and their advent will create a revolution as early as eighteen ninety eight i proposed to representatives of a large manufacturing concern the construction and public exhibition of an automobile carriage which left to itself would perform a great variety of operations involving something akin to judgment but my proposal was deemed chimerical at that time and nothing came from it at present many of the ablest minds are trying to devise expedients for preventing a repetition of the awful conflict which is only theoretically ended and the duration and main issues of which i have correctly predicted in an article printed in the sun of december twentieth nineteen fourteen the proposed league is not a remedy but on the contrary in the opinion of a number of competent men may bring about results just the opposite it is particularly regrettable that a punitive policy was adopted in framing the terms of peace because a few years hence it will be possible for nations to fight without armies ships or guns by weapons far more terrible to the destructive action and range of which there is virtually no limit any city at a distance whatsoever from the enemy can be destroyed by him and no power on earth can stop him from doing so if we want to avert an impending calamity and a state of things which may transform this globe into an inferno we should push the development of flying machines and wireless transmission of energy without an instant's delay and with all the power and resources of the nation End of section 6